Welcome to Save Me Lives Podcast. I'm Eddie Joe. Today is the 5th of March of 2021. And I'm not going to belabor this too much, but here's a spoiler alert. We should stop using azithromycin in the community setting for COVID-19. And what I mean by community setting is the outpatient setting. The recommendation and the rationale for this recommendation was based on an article that was published just yesterday on the 4th of March in The Lancet. The article is titled, Azithromycin for Community Treatment of Suspected COVID-19 in People at Increased Risk of an Adverse Clinical Course in the UK. I know this is a long title, but there's more to go, so just bear with me because it explains what type of trial it was. And in this case, it was a randomized, controlled, open-label, adaptive platform trial. These people over there in the UK, they had a whole bunch of trials going on simultaneously, and they did phenomenal, phenomenal work. I definitely do recommend that you read this article for yourself as as it is free for you to download. It's down in the show notes, it's down on my website on eddiejoemd.com and you can download it and not trust me because I definitely recommend that you read this article for yourself. I'm an intensive care physician, guys. I take care of people in the ICU, do vents, drips, sedation, all that stuff. That's what I do. So when it comes to talking about outpatient management of patients, I feel that I am out of place, which is another reason why you should read this article for yourself. But I do feel that the outpatient setting is the best place to start managing these patients because the sooner we can start different therapies, the more we could avoid them ending up in the hospital and therefore avoid them ending in my hands in the intensive care unit where unfortunately outcomes are not as, uh, as good as we want them to be. And I honestly wish that we had better treatments to mitigate hospitalizations. There are not a lot of outpatient studies that are going on right now, unfortunately. But given these data from this trial, it appears that azithromycin is not going to be that treatment that's going to be the silver bullet to keep people out of the hospital. I I definitely do have to tip my hat to the authors of this paper and everybody who collaborated to perform this trial because it's, it's a pretty big trial at the end of the day. The first question that you're probably asking yourself, because I asked myself the same question at one time too, was why are we looking at azithromycin, which we all know that it's an antibiotic. Why are we looking at azithromycin to treat a virus? I mean, it just doesn't make sense, right? Well, that's at face value. But when you look a little bit deeper into how they've done research on this particular medication, it turns out that there are in vitro, meaning, you know, in the lab, in a test tube, basically. That suggests that azithromycin could potentially work against a virus that causes COVID, which is the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And the article goes into further detail from a biological perspective into how it could interfere with intracellular SARS-CoV-2 activity, as well as replication. It's honestly pretty darn fascinating. I can't go into that into too much detail here because I'll be speaking for like 20 minutes. But it's pretty darn cool, at least to our nerdy selves who listen to this type of podcast and for me who creates this type of podcast. But in addition, it has been known that azithromycin has the ability to reduce levels of the pro-inflammatory cytokines such as interleukin-6 that we're also fascinated about with this virus. I mean, prior to this pandemic, not many people knew anything about interleukins. And, and, I, and I mean like the general public, not us in the medical community as we've been trained about it for years. Unfortunately, though, trials that have looked at azithromycin in the inpatient setting, whether they be in ICU patients or in ward patients, have sadly been negative. And I say sadly because I do like cheap, in a, cheap effective, readily available medications to give to my patients. I don't like Like the multi-thousand dollar drugs, I'm not a huge fan of those. I mean, I know they're necessary, of course, but I'd rather give somebody something that costs $3 than to give somebody something that costs $300. Let's let's just be honest. So let's, let's get a little bit deeper into the contents of this study. It bears repeating that this is an outpatient study. And they, they took... There are other studies, like there was one hydroxychloroquine study out there that looked at people who were 40 years old. I mean, I thought that was pretty much ridiculous, but this was an outpatient study that looked at individuals who were at risk for deleterious effects of COVID-19. We all know who these patients are. They're the people who are over 65 years of age, or in this case, they use 65 years or over, 
and patients who are 50 years of age and older who, are, who have at least one comorbidity. And we, we all know what these comorbidity, comorbidities are. We see them in our respective hospitals. And these patients were also not feeling well for 14 days or less because it's, it's of importance to get these people early on before their whole inflammatory process kicks in. And the exact details of the patient selection are noted in the article, and I'm not going to be redundant and read, the, read these to you. But the patients were randomized into two groups. There was an intervention group, in other words, the group that got the azithromycin, and they received 500 milligrams once daily for three days, plus the usual care, of course versus the control group, which only got the usual care. Originally, the study had a primary outcome, which I liked the whole bunch, which was just hospitalization or death within 28 days. And the reason why I like this particular outcome was because this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to avoid people ending up in the hospital or passing away, even worse, of course, right? But we have to take into account how studies are powered to show statistical significance, as I trip over my words there. And it would take thousands of patients to be enrolled into a study in order to show these outcomes of death within 28 days or even hospitalizations. And the reason why I go ahead and say that is because out of the, this whole entire group of patients, whether in, it included the patients who were in the control group or the intervention group, only 1% of patients ended up in the ICU. So, or let me take a quick look at what that outcome was. Excuse me, as I just quickly scroll through. Sorry that I'm doing that with uh, the mic recording. I could go ahead and just stop it, but I want to give you guys the appropriate information because I have the table right here. And so it shows that 1%, yeah, I was right in what I said, 1% of patients in this group, whether it was the control group or whether it was the intervention group, only 1% ended up in the ICU. But again, it turns out that the authors had to change the primary outcome because their calculations ended up being that they were going to underpower the study and therefore they weren't going to be able to publish it with, the, with those outcomes. So that being the case, they developed co-primary uh, outcomes, which included first to self-reported recovery within 28 days. And then they also added on along with hospitalization or death within 28 days. So they, they it seems as if they were able to recruit 1,323 patients into the study. Unfortunately, though, the primary outcome did not reach statistical significance. There was no difference in how quickly people recovered. There was no difference in hospitalization, and there was no difference in death at 28 days. And again, this is regardless of the patient population that was explored, because they also did a whole bunch of subgroup analysis, which was fantastic. I, I think they did a great job at trying to tease out who this could benefit. So the authors took the time to analyze different subgroups based on the age, comorbidities, duration of illness, as well as the symptom severity score, which is listed there. And unfortunately, they weren't able to see any of the secondary outcomes either, which obtained clinical statistical significance. One of the patients, excuse me, one of the pieces of information that could be teased out, as I mentioned before, is that approximately 1% of patients ended up in the ICU. All in all, the authors report that, quote, our findings show that azithromycin should not be used routinely to treat COVID-19 in the community and older adults in absence of additional indications. Again, this is disappointing because we're looking for additional tools in our arsenal to help defeat the virus and avoid hospitalization. It appears as if azithromycin is not that tool, but hopefully we can find one soon. I'd like to thank you all for sticking with me as we keep on going through this journey, trying to tease out ways to better take care of our patients. Definitely do not take this as medical advice. Read the article for yourself. Definitely recommend it. Appreciate all your support. Hope you all have a great day. Thanks a lot. Bye.